Um, so uh, tonight we're very fortunate. Um, November, of course, as you all know, is Alaska Native, Native American Heritage Month. And so uh, we've been planning this for a while, and we're very lucky to, be, to really have a, 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 a very important figure uh, as a guest tonight, and that is Emil Nadi. Um, some of you have read about some of his material. Some of you are very familiar with his biography, but he was very involved in the land claims movement in the 1960s. He's Athabascan. He was uh, born in the village of Kayakuk. He served in the U.S. Navy, and then he also has had a very important career in uh, state politics and has been commissioner in several different state um, uh, uh, divisions as well. And he continues to be a huge advocate for Alaska Native people. So his knowledge, um, we're, we're, we're trying to persuade him to write a book um, because you know he, ha he has so much knowledge of that time period that obviously was very tumultuous, which resulted in the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act and the formation of the corporation. So he has had He's one of those individuals, his work has had an indelible imprint um, in our current life, um, whether you're native or non-native. And so um, he's got so much information, I just love sitting down and talking with him. And so uh, in, without much further ado, I will ask our esteemed speaker, Mr. Emil Nadi, to, to come to the podium. All right, thanks. Um, I'm glad to be here tonight. Um, still think that's a little bit loud. Um, I'm assuming that you have uh, a lot of knowledge about land claims, so I won't go through a lot of details, but what I'd like to do is open it up to questions in a little while and uh, try to bring it to life. I'll, I'll talk about some incidents that as we went through the the struggle and the arguments for land claims. <clears throat> Just a little bit of background. The struggle for in Alaska has been going on for a long time. 1914 was one of the first meetings they had with the Ten Mile Chiefs with Judge Wickersham, who was a delegate to Congress. And the people traveled to Nenana by canoe. They paddled upriver up the Ten Mile River a couple hundred miles for the first meeting. <clears throat> and the big complaint was that they didn't mind miners coming into the country, but they, they wanted to, uh, did not want their hunting <clears throat> to be disturbed. And all they wanted to do was be left alone. So that was the first effort. What did I do to it? Anyway, just some notes of interest. When, when the, the flag of the Russian uh, of Russia came down, the American flag went up. The, the historian Bancroft wrote in his History of Alaska that uh, when one flag came down, the other went up, control of Alaska went from one European country to the offshoots of another uh, European group of people, and neither one had any rights to the land. <clears throat> so it's been well known that the, no title to the land past. There's three, three ways you get land. Someone gives it to you, you buy it, or you win it in the war. None of those things happened in Alaska. So we still had title. We just didn't know it because um, titles meant nothing in the old, old uh, ways of doing things in the, in the country. <clears throat> I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. So um, in 1940, the census in Alaska was 72,000 people. And demographers tell us that the uh, native became a minority in Alaska in 1939. So I was born in Alaska when we, when we were in the majority. So <clears throat> I grew up and uh, started out as a, a trapper and went to a boarding school at age 11 and, and went through Mount Edgecombe and graduated in 1951. <clears throat> but that started the growth in Alaska because the military people came here and liked it and stayed. And uh, it's been the policy of the United States government to grow Alaska, um, mainly I think because of fear of being captured. In 1940 we were afraid that we were going to be taken over by the Japanese and 
1940, there were no military defenses in Alaska. All the buildup came afterwards. I shouldn't say no. They had three Navy bases, I think, prior to 1940. But everything else was after, came after that. And it was with the growth that we had started having conflicts in land. In 1940, when there were 72,000 people in Alaska, you could go anywhere, use land anywhere. People respected your trap line, respected your, your fishing camps. Um, some trap lines were three days, took three days to go around them, and people didn't cross their other people's uh, use of land. It was when um, people started moving in and getting homesteads and trade manufacturing sites and campsites that started to have conflicts in land. But the big conflict came after statehood. <clears throat> the state had a right to select 103 million acres of land, and when they started doing that, they disregarded the use of land they didn't recognize use of land because you didn't have, people didn't have titles. So Native people started protesting. And <clears throat> protests got so bad that finally uh, it, it was interfering with state selections of land and people writing the Secretary of Interior. The Secretary of Interior had to protect the rights of Native people, so, <clears throat> so they decided to do something about it. The B, what started the land claims effort was uh, the director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Juneau got the, uh, was tapped to become Secretary of Interior in Washington, D.C. And he went before the United States Senate in confirmation hearings. And uh, Scoop Jackson, who had a lot of experience, he was from Washington State, had a lot of experience with Indian people because of Indians in his state. He was involved with termination of, of native tribes and, and reservations, and they didn't, that didn't work. So Bob Bennett was an Oneida Indian from uh, Minnesota, I think from up there. And he started to describe the uh, condition, uh, in the, uh, scoping the problem in America. They called it the Indian problem, and, and Scoop Jackson stopped them and said, I don't want an off-the-cuff answer. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on the Indian people, and nothing is changing for the past 200 years. I want a written report So, in 90 days. So when that 90-day report came out, and the hearing was in January 1966. His 90-day report came out in April, and I got a copy of that report, and the devoted, BIA devoted one page to Alaska, and it said, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was drawing up a final solution to the land problem in Alaska. And I thought about that and said, well, you know, if we have any rights in land, we should have something to say about that settlement. And I waited a few months, and I thought, there were a lot of, a lot of people who knew something about it much more than I did. I knew nothing about it. Um, I was a young engineer out of school, knew nothing about law or dealing with Congress. And nothing happened, so I gave it to Howard Rock, editor and publisher of the Thunder Times, and he headlined it, statewide meeting called for, because I wrote a letter to uh, 14 people and said we have to meet. Most of them I didn't know. Uh, so he ran stories from uh, July until October. We had the first gathering. Instead of 14 people showing up, 300 people showed up. And we agreed at that time to form an organization. Uh, <clears throat> and the rest is history, as they say. But uh, we started having trouble with the state right from the beginning. The governor was uh, Hickel, and he, like everybody else, I have to say nobody in Alaska could do anything about land claims, how to deal with it. There was no precedent for it. No one had ever dealt with a settlement except through war. And so <clears throat> we had no roadmap to follow. And Hickel's statement was, 
There's no legal basis for land claims. He tied up every radio station in Alaska at one time, and it didn't matter where you turned your radio dial, you heard Wally Hickel, and one of the things he said was, uh, just because someone's grandparent chased a moose across the tundra doesn't give him any rights to land. So <clears throat> that was where we started. Um, we drew up our first land bill. We had, we had no money uh, at all. I took over AFN when we had uh, nine dollars in the bank. And <clears throat> we financed it. There was, there was a great deal of interest in it. All over the state, people were being encroached upon their, on the lands, uh, their lands that they used. Their lifestyle was disappearing. Uh, trapping was re being restricted. Hunting was being restricted and, and uh, a lot of competition for it. So people were getting uneasy about it. And <clears throat> so I was, uh, I was in a meeting with Stanley McCutcheon, who was a local attorney, and uh, he knew Stuart Udall. And we were talking about it, and he said, well, Stuart Udall is supposed to be protecting the native rights. So he picked up the phone and called uh, Stuart Udall, Secretary of Interior, and during the conversation, I heard one side of it, and Stanley was reminding him that he had a, his duty to protect the lands of Native people. And um, so he suggested to him, he said, just withdraw the land. You, you, have, you can do that. Just, just withdraw the land and stop all transactions. He stopped the state selections of the 103 million acres that they had on their land claims. <coughs> Home, homesteads, trade and manufacturing sites, cabin sites were all stopped. And of course that caused an uproar. Governor filed a lawsuit saying it's illegal. They were filing, they were driving the state of Alaska into bankruptcy. At that time the state budget was $300 million compared to about $12 billion today. So you can see it was, uh, the state was broke. But uh, <clears throat> so Hickel hired a, uh, an outside lawyer. He, he didn't trust his attorney general because he didn't know anything about land. And, and neither did the lawyer he hired. It was Edgar Paul Boyko. And, uh, and he was a very smart guy. He, he gave us a lot of trouble, and uh, <clears throat> so I'll, get, I'll just get to some stories. One day I got a call. He said, yeah, we have to go to Bethel. I said, why do I have to go to Bethel? He said, well, they're not sure. They're having a fishing problem over there with the state. The state is threatening to, uh, to arrest the uh, fishermen over there on the beach if they sell to the Japanese. And uh, so I got on an afternoon plane, or early, about 10 o'clock, I got on a plane to Bethel. On the way over, a state trooper sat by me, and he was in full dress uniform. And he said, why are you going to Bethel? I said, well, I don't know. I got a call said I should go there. And uh, I looked at him. I said, well, why are you going to Bethel? He said, I don't know either. <laughs> I got a call from the governor's office and they said I should get over there. So we got off the plane and what we found was uh, there were already some legislators over there and uh, some state people. The legislators was, they were beaten up on the state people, a couple of deputy commissioners and division directors and, um, and telling they were, had different views. Of course the state people were carrying out the orders of the governor. And so <clears throat> the Chuck Cicero was a state representative, got on the, he was on the radio and telling people to sell fish. And I got on a, a little plane on, on floats and flew down to Kuskokwim and we'd land at the fish camp and climb the bank. And I remember the, the typical fish camp, a couple of tents and three generations of people. You got the little kids and the parents and then the grandparents. And I was telling them to, uh, 
if the Japanese offer them a better price, sell to the Japanese. Yes. And they were saying, well, we'll go to jail. I said, you're not going to jail. And I had to go through an interpreter because uh, the old parents that did not understand English. So I did that all, all, all day. And then that night, I got back to Anchorage and I took a 10 o'clock plane to Juneau. And with me was uh, Cliff Grohl, who was uh, one of our attorneys. And we were going down to talk to Hickel to support. We were asking 40 million acres of land. The state was opposing it. So we went down for the meeting with the governor to ask him to support 40 million acres. Congress was not going to give us 40 million acres, allow us to get 40 million acres, if the state opposed it. So we had to convince the governor to support us. <clears throat> and I, when I said, I'm gonna, after we finished talking about fish, or after we finished talking about land, I'm going to ask the governor about this fishing problem out there. And the lawyer said, oh, I, I wouldn't do that. So I said, well, I think I will. So uh, 7 o'clock the next morning, we're sitting in the governor's office. And before, before we had a chance to say anything, the governor, there's no way to put it, he came unglued. <clears throat> pounding the table and saying, what in blazes were you guys doing out in Bethel? Giving me a lot of trouble. Um, and <clears throat> he was having, what was bothering him, what was really bothering him was he had bought a Norwegian cruiser, cruise ship, that he was using in the ferry system. Well, federal law says you can't use a foreign vessel to sail between American ports. So Alaska ferry system couldn't leave Seattle and land in Ketchikan or anywhere else, so they had to run the Wickersham from, from Vancouver, British Columbia. And he was saying, you guys ought to be helping me solve this problem. You can make one telephone call to Senator Bartlett and have them solve the Jones Act problem and let us sail that ship there. <clears throat> and uh, he always asking me for favors, why don't you help me once in a while? And, and I won't use the language he used, but it was pretty raw. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, he stopped and, and, and he pointed at me and said, and what were you doing in Bethel taking the governor's office on? I said, well, governor, maybe we ought to talk about that in a minute. I was out there because the fish buyers on the bank were buying fish illegally. They were selling, they were buying fish in the round. And state law calls, calls for them to buy by the pound. And I watched them throw fish off of their boats. And as it flew by, the buyer was saying small, small, medium, small. And I saw some real big king salmon go by. So he stopped me and he said, well, you're right. You're right, but I had those buyers in my office and I squared their heads and they're now buying fish by the pound. And then he stopped and said, well, boys, what are we here for? So, so then we started talking about his support for, for 40 million acres. <clears throat> and um, he agreed, finally he agreed. He, sa he said, I'll, I'll support 40 million acres. So we got down to D.C. and uh, we we're supposed to have a hearing in the morning. His commissioner, the uh, Natural Resources, came and said, uh, the governor wants to talk to you. So we went down to the hotel. He didn't, he didn't come in the room. We were in a separate room and he was down the hallway. And the commissioner said, the governor can't support 40 million acres. He said, well, he promised to. No, he can't do it. So we got into a terrible argument. It lasted until about 10 o'clock. And finally, someone went down the hall to the governor and said, uh, came back and said, well, the governor wants to talk to you guys. So he went in and <clears throat> um, Hickel said, well, what's the problem? We said, well, governor, you promised to support 40 million acres of land. And your commissioner here is telling us you're not going to do it. So he said, well, did I, did I promise that? He said, yes, you did. 
He said, well, then I'll, then I'll support you. So we were all happy, finally. And uh, next morning he went to testify and he got on sand and he said, the state of Alaska supports 40 million acres of land for the native people. However, 20 million has to come out of federal reserves, forest service, military withdrawals, federal parks, which uh, didn't make us too happy for that day. But <clears throat> we went on anyway, and uh, it was a fight every, every time we turned around. So he was a governor for two years when rumors started circulating that uh, Nixon, who just got elected, was going to make him Secretary of Interior. And <clears throat> he went back to D.C. and on his way back to Anchorage, he stopped in Seattle one night to switch planes coming to Anchorage. And reporters were all there waiting for him. They, they had to ask him questions about being Secretary of Interior. And they, they were well aware of the, the uh, fight over withdrawing states' uh, selections. And they said, what are you going to do about the land freeze? And Hickel said, well, what you all can do with a stroke of a pen, I can undo. So then they said, uh, what do you think about Julia Butler Hansen? And he said, who the hell is Julia Butler Hansen? And they said, well, she's the second congressman from Washington State that's in charge of your budget. So he found out real quick. <laughs> who she was, and so he got back here, and a couple days later I got a call from an attorney right at 5 o'clock, and he said, Secretary Venturi wants to talk to you, meet you at his home. And it took me a second. I said, well, I, I don't know where he lives. So he said, well, I'll pick you up. So he took, I thought he was talking about Udall, but he took me over to, I figured out, Hickel. So we went over to Hickel, and Hickel had in his hand what would be going tomorrow morning's paper. It was a column by uh, Jack Anderson, who was a columnist, a uh, national col columnist. <clears throat> and in the room was a publisher of the morning paper and a star reporter. And the star reporter's named Joe Rothstein, and, and, uh, and this article said, Hickel does not deserve to be Secretary of Interior because of his handling of the fish flap in Bethel. He didn't treat the Eskimos right there. And so he turned to me and he said, uh, you talk to the Indian people down south? And I said, yeah. He said, well, can you get them get an endorsement for me? And I said, well, I think so. And he said, well, will AFN give me an endorsement? And I said, well, I could probably get you one. And he said, well, I'd like to have one. And I said, well, I can't do that until you promise you're not going to lift the land freeze. And I said, <clears throat> he said, well, we, we're not going to hurt you. We'll put money into escrow up land transfers. But, uh, but he wouldn't answer me that. I said, I, I can't get you an endorsement unless you promise not to hold the land freeze. So that's kind of where we left it, and we left his house, and the attorney was very unhappy with me. He said, uh, you, you called the governor a liar. I said, no, I didn't call him a liar. Well, you did call him a liar. I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, you're going to have to deal with, with him as governor if he doesn't make it and you're going to have to deal with him as Secretary of Interior if he does make it. <clears throat> and uh, he said, I can't work with you. I said, well, okay, if that's your decision. So he, he resigned. He quit. So <clears throat> um, we got back to D.C. during confirmation hearings. And <clears throat> the board of directors of AFN said, uh, pick three people and go back to D.C. 
during confirmation hearings and, and hold the land freeze. Make him promise in, in confirmation hearings that he holds the land freeze. So I picked John Borbridge, Willie Hensley, and Evan Hobson. John Borbridge was from Juneau. Evan Hobson was from Barrow. <coughs> And uh, Willie Hensley was from Kotzebue. So we got down there, and uh, for, it was a three-day hearing. That was unusually long for a Secretary of Interior. But we would go into a senator's office, and they'd say, what do you want to do? They'd say, well, to see the senator. And we were talking to all the senators on the uh, Interior Committee. And they said, what do you want to talk to him about? We want to talk to him about his confirmation about Secretary of Interior. It was from Alaska from Alaska, come on. They'd drag us into a back room and they'd set us down and start asking us all kinds of questions about, about Hickel. What do you know about his business dealings? What do we know about the, rail, the, the pipeline road going north? What do you know about his building the uh, gas line from here to Kenai? What do you know about his hotels? He said, nothing. We don't know anything about his business. We only want one thing. We want him to hold the land freeze. So. We lobbied all the senators, and <clears throat> about the second day, we were get, we'd get there early and get the front row seat at the hearings. And one day we got there, and the first three rows were full, blocked off. They were empty, but they were blocked off. So we sat in the next row, <clears throat> and pretty soon here came the first row. First three rows were filled with who's who in Alaska. Labor unions, Teamsters, business people, bankers, you, uh, newspaper people, uh, all the social organizations, Chamber of Commerce, and they were sitting there. And, and uh, Senator Stevens, was, before they got started, said, well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to introduce some outstanding Alaskans who are here to support our governor for Secretary of Interior. So the first three rows stood up and Borbridge and Willie and Eben and I were still sitting behind there. They'd turn around and look at us and say, what the hell's the matter with you guys? Why aren't you standing up? Don't you support the governor? And say, yeah, we support the governor, but we want him to hold the land freeze. So they, were, they weren't very happy with us. But uh, after the third they, we would sit there, and governor, they'd ask him a question, and we didn't, they had, they had him pinned. They had knew everything about him, his business dealings, but we were only interested in land claims and the land freeze, <clears throat> and they'd ask him, and he'd answer a question that isn't quite what we understood the answer should be. So we'd get of our, out of our chair and go down the hallway and knock on the door, which was behind the, the hearing, Somebody would open it up and say, we'd have a note and say this uh, answer to that question. So we'd sit down and pretty soon the door would open behind the senators and, and uh, this aide would walk out and whisper to the senator and <clears throat> senator would say, the chairman, I'd like to get back to my question. And we did that for three days and <clears throat> got his answers on the record. The third day, um, Scoop Jackson said, uh, he didn't even sit down. He walked in, called, called the meeting to order, and said, Governor, we've been dealing with an issue for two days now, and I thought we'd put it to rest. But after reading the record last night, I'm not too sure. He said, will you hold the land freeze? Will you not dispose of any land, transfer any land from the federal government to anybody without coming to this committee? And I thought, this was an up and down question. His confirmation was in the balance. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he said, yes, I will do that. He abdicated the power of the Secretary of Interior for confirmation. And very unusual committee report. Uh, I don't know if I just want to say this on record, but they said, um, well, it's in the congressional record, or should be. So the committee said, we find them minimally qualified to be Secretary of Interior. 
So they recommended confirmation. But that, it took a lot of work to get them to hold the land freeze, <clears throat> which was key. As long as everybody was suffering, it was holding up, could have held up the pipeline. Uh, homesteaders were not getting titles to their land. Trade manufacturing sites weren't being issued. Um, cabin sites, docks, airfields, roads, nothing was moving. And as long as everybody was um, hurting, they started getting pressure in Congress. And Scoop Jackson was in favor of it. He said, I want everybody's toes to the fire so, until we solve this. And if Congress gets around to solving the problem, we want to have something to divide up. We don't want this thing to just to, uh, to uh, disappear piece by piece. And I thought it, it was a good thing because if it was an Indian problem, it would be here for the next 100 years. If it's uh, everybody's problem, they're going to get enough pressure on Congress to do something. So they did. We were always a little bit worried about what the oil companies might do. They had power, <coughs> and uh, we were worried about, about them. And they did nothing, as far as we could tell. But when they got to the holding up the pipeline, I th this is my speculation now. What I think they said to Congress was, hey, look, we're not interested in land claims. We don't care what you do with it, but just solve it. We are not concerned about acreage. We're not concerned about money. We just want that right away. So solve the problem. And Congress did. So <clears throat> we had a lot of opposition. Everywhere we turned in Alaska was opposition. Uh, the very first day we called AFN together. It wasn't AFN, it was just a gathering. <clears throat> we, we called it together at 10 o'clock in the morning. The newspapers, the, the evening newspaper goes to print about 4 o'clock or sometime. No, I'm sorry. The evening newspaper comes out about 4 o'clock, so they, they go to print probably 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. We called our meeting to order 10 o'clock, and about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, headlines in the paper was native split. Um, they were trying to uh, divide us right from the very first day. And um, <clears throat> they, they knew native people didn't get along very well. This was a different day, you know, it was 1966. So Eskimos didn't trust Aleuts, Aleuts didn't trust Athabascans, Athabascans didn't trust Clinkus, and Clinkus didn't trust anybody. So, so there was a lot of uh, getting to know each other <coughs> and try to make an organization stick together between people who used to war with each other. And uh, Kobuk people used to come over to the Kayakuk people and steal the women. And uh, I, I wonder how many times I heard this story, how the Cordova people fought the uh, Clinkets. The last battle between the Clinkets and the Cordova people was in the Kayak, I, Kayak Island. And that's as far north as the Clinkets got. So that's where the boundary is. And uh, <clears throat> those, those wounds were not very old. So we got to know each other. Sometimes pretty had a pretty rough time getting to know each other. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I'll tell you something about the push. We had no money. I took over AFN when we had $9 in the bank. And for about five years, I worked for $1,000, $1,400 a month at the most. We had absolutely no money. People were sending in $2 donations to keep us going so we could pay our phone bills. And um, <clears throat> one, one week, literally, my family ate out of one pot of beans. Uh, there were a lot of sacrifices being made by everybody 
in the in the game. <coughs> uh, Chamber of Commerce at an annual meeting opposed us, mocked us, put on a reservation hat with an arrow through it, and said, "What are the native people in Alaska trying to do?" They didn't believe in it. We had people on the Johnny Carson show. Laura Burke, Eskimo woman, uh, presented Johnny Carson with an usuk, if you know what that is. I won't try to describe it here. But uh, <coughs> uh, AFL-CIO, I talked to Daughters of American Revolution in D.C. The biggest group I talked to was uh, American Council of Churches. I went to Cobol Hall in Detroit during their convention. <clears throat> and the night before I was to talk to the Cobol Hall, to the place that's full of ministers <clears throat> and bishops everywhere, I had dinner with the secretary of the Nas uh, World Council of Churches. I didn't know who he was, but we had a long conversation. And <clears throat> next day when he introduced me to, uh, to ask the Council of Churches to endorse <clears throat> endorse our bill. Uh, when I got up on the stage, here's this whole row of, of bishops longer than this room. And Vietnam War was on. And here came a bunch of young people uh, screaming and yelling. And they came along the whole front row with buckets of red paint and was running along and dumping red, dumping red paint uh, on all the papers that were in front of the, on the table in front of the bishops. And to their credit, the bishops sat there and uh, didn't say a word. And when they were done, the, nobody made a move on these protesters uh, protesting the war. And so they left. And they asked, <clears throat> then I got up to the microphone and I asked them for, for um, endorsement, and uh, somebody way in back of the room. When I say way in back of the room, there were 10,000 preachers in that hall. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, he said, uh, before we endorse uh, a bill, he said, we ought to know what the conditions on the bill are. And the guy I had dinner with last night got up and said, what do we care what, this, what they're asking for? If they think it's a fair deal, we ought to endorse it. So they did. We got a unanimous endorsement. And they said, we, as preachers, any Sunday morning, we, we, we're talking to 40 million people in America. And if we go home and tell our people to write their congressman, uh, that's the kind of uh, pressure we needed from people around the state, <clears throat> around the country. And we'd get down there. <coughs> I know I'm jumping around. And we'd have a hearing set for, say, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We'd go to testify, and they'd say, well, come back tomorrow morning. <clears throat> and uh, we'd travel all that way, and prepared and ready to go, and they're saying, come back tomorrow. And after a while, that got uh, irritating. But there were two big things in Congress that that took precedence. Number one, of course, was Vietnam War. Uh, <clears throat> and the second one, surprisingly, you don't hear anything about it, but the supersonic transport debates. And the debate was whether the supersonic transports were going to fly across the United States. And the fear was, excuse me, the testimony was, was the protest against it was that they called it rolling thunder. Yeah. They didn't want this, these airplanes thundering overhead and rattling their <coughs> windows and waking the babies up. And so they protested it, and that, that was a horrible fight in Congress. I mean, not maybe horrible, but it was uh, intense argument. So if you know, supersonic transport never crossed America in commercial flight. They all landed on the East Coast. So but we were getting pushed around by that. So I was going down, this after about three years, I was going down to Seattle 
to talk to the <coughs> Northwest Federated Tribes. And they were in Scoop Jackson's background. They were his voters. And uh, <coughs> he was a chairman handling our bill, so I wanted to get some help from them. So I, t I talked to them at the Pacific Lutheran University. There were about 600 Indians in the crowd. And, uh, and I, I, I wanted I wanted to get their attention that this was an important issue. And I wanted the guy in Alabama and Texas and wherever to figure out, say, what, what's this all about? So I made a speech and I said if Congress couldn't see their way to a 40 million acre settlement, that I was going to recommend to AFN, Board of Directors, that we go to the World Court or the United Nations and ask for, for a settlement with the United States. And surprisingly, I don't know how people found me, but it did make, I got newspaper clippings from Kansas and other places. So I like to think it, it helped. But uh, everywhere we could, we could uh, talk, we, we, we pushed. Um, One other thing, I don't, I don't tell this very often, but you know, it's been a, year, a lot of long time, so I'll tell it. <coughs> um, John Sackett was a senator, and he, he was the first one. He elbowed up to me one day and punched me on the elbow and said, hey, watch out, there's a contract out on you. I said, yeah, yeah, John. And a couple days later, somebody else said, hey, watch out, there's a contract out on you. So one day, <coughs> I called, uh, Attorney General, it was Avram Gross, and I said, Av, what do you know about a contract? I have this uh, persistent rumor. And he said, I don't know anything about it, but I'll stay right where you are, and I'll have somebody call you back, or I'll call you back. About 15 minutes ahead of the state troopers called me and said, what you've been hearing is true. What you don't know is that we, we're with you 24 hours a day. We're outside of your house, we go to school with your kids, we watch them get off the bus. After school, we watch them get on the bus. We follow the bus home. We watch them go into your house. We're outside of your house 24 hours a day. And I started noticing when I go to lunch, where there's always somebody they'd come in behind me and sit down. <coughs> After about two weeks, I thought, well, you know, was, I forgot about it. They're going to want to get you. They would do it. and. Uh, but the, but the head of the state troopers told me, he said, um, what, uh, he said, we know, we know all the people involved. We got all the names, we found somebody in the circle, and she was out on probation, and we pulled her in and got the names and said, if anything happened, we'll, we'll get all of you. So <clears throat> that died off. So it wasn't, it, we did have a lot of opposition. Every group, miners, association, and especially the Chamber of Commerce, editorials against us. Um, when I said I, to just previous story, when I said I'd go to the United Nations and uh, <clears throat> ask for help, what I said was if, if Congress can't see their way to, to settle this, um, we spent billions of dollars reestablishing a country for people who did not have a country, who were dispersed all over the world. We spent billions of dollars to reestablish a country of Israel. How could we do less for people who lost all the North American continent? And I was going to propose that we set aside a separate country not a state, a separate country, for Native people who would be open to any, any indigenous person in North America who wanted to come to it. And of course that made the newspapers and uh, the Anchorage Times wrote an editorial that said, surely Mr. Naughty jests. And uh, the senator got up on the floor down in Juneau and called me a communist. And, uh, <clears throat> so, really wasn't a lot of fun. It wasn't a fun time for me. 
Um, anyway. We, I say we had a lot of opposition <clears throat> from, there were eight bills introduced before it was all over. Our bill was the first one, the state had a bill, Sec <clears throat> the Interior Department had a bill, Senate Interior Committee had a bill, House Interior Committee had a bill, Federal Field Committee, which was headed by a, a point, uh, chairman was appointed by the president, they had a bill. There were eight bills. and. <clears throat> And they went behind closed doors and picked and choose from the bills. Everybody got something. Everybody lost something. But there's something, there's a misunderstanding about what happened. People talk about the, the negotiated deal. It was not a negotiated settlement. Um, <clears throat> it was done unilaterally. Um, they handed out what and by that time we were, we were tired, we were worn out, we were broke, uh, we accepted it. Because if we didn't accept it, we'd be in another battle with a new Congress. <clears throat> and uh, I was over in Canada here two years ago, I was in Ottawa. I was invited to talk to uh, a national meeting of uh, their indigenous people, First Nations they call themselves. And <clears throat> when I said that this, settlement in Alaska was not negotiated, there was a gasp in the room. I mean, they, they literally, they couldn't believe it. Because the federal, the uh, Canadian government funds the native organizations, pays for them, pays the money to, so they can hire lawyers and anthropologists and make their case. And uh, so they have a, uh, they did get a separate nation. Nunavut is a, nation controlled by the, by the northern Eskimos in the eastern part of Canada. So they're much more progressive than we are. But when everybody, anybody writes about the, a negotiated settlement, it was, did, did not happen. <clears throat> I could go on, but uh, I'd like to hear some questions. So that's where you get the best information. Find out what's on your mind. Any questions? No. Oh. Have you um, considered some of the changes that the Alaska Native Corporations have gone through since the beginning? Um, do you have any statements to make about how they evolved? Yeah. <clears throat> one, of, one of the big changes was uh, the Security and Exchange Commission has some very strict rules about reporting from corporations. And we we didn't have any experience with corporations and reports and all that, so we asked for a five-year moratorium. Well, we got used to putting out annual reports and balance sheets and all these things that go into the report. And there are very strict rules about what you report, what you have to report, what you don't report, you can get in trouble for. So they gave us a, a five-year moratorium. What happened right away was that corporations requested uh, to be re relieved from reporting. So today, th there's no oversight on the corporations. And I was in a meeting with a corporation one day and I looked at the annual report and I said, this is, uh, the numbers in here are just plug numbers. They don't really mean anything. The assets and the liabilities and the equities, they all, it all balances out, but the numbers that fill them in aren't uh, always real. So that was one big change. <clears throat> I do have a question on the level of the bike. Um, the bike 
microphone is for recording in the video camera, um, so just speak extra loud. So you don't have to hold it really close to you. Um, there's a topic of discussion today among Alaska Native community in regarding Indian country. So we are working on a paper and we had a question about the tribes and the state of Alaska. Would you think that there's a po positive outcome in Indian, com Indian country coming to Alaska and would there be any negative impact as well? Mm -hmm. The question was about Indian, Indian country in Alaska. And of course <coughs> that's a controversial question. And uh, <clears throat> the villages support it. The corporations do not support it. And that's unfortunate because the same shareholders in the village are shareholders in the corporation. <clears throat> to, to a corporation, land is just an asset. You sell it, you encumber it, you borrow against it, you do, you, you do all these things with it. To the village, that's who they are. They are land-based people, and uh, they want to keep their land intact. <clears throat> if it's fee title lands, it'll be sold, in my, in my view. So <clears throat> the best deal, I think, would be for a compromise. The regional corporations are assets that can be sold and bought and whatnot. The village corporations, I think, if the people want it left in trust lands, then they should leave it, put them in trust lands. But that's still a fight that's working its way through the courts right now. <clears throat> it was close to a, a decision in the courts, but the state of Alaska asked for an extension of time. So it's, it's pending. <clears throat> said it wasn't negotiated. Um, my question would be, what is a major inclusion that you would have liked to seen in the Angska that was not a part of it? Well, the big thing that we lost was <clears throat> as a land deal, as long as it parties agree, it can come to any kind of agreement you want. <clears throat> and our position was, uh, if the land has value, we want to participate in that wealth. All wealth comes from the land, and uh, <clears throat> that's a, you get the basic industries is where your wealth is. So <clears throat> we asked for a two percent on all underground assets, wealth, and Congress went behind closed doors and took it out, and they put a limit of nine. 962 and a half million. Well, they put a mil limit of uh, 500 million from the 2%. They paid 490, 492 and a half, 496 and a half million dollars from the Treasury and then told the state of Alaska to pay 500 million from the 2% out of the royalty from coming from oil, sale of oil. <clears throat> and the state of Alaska paid it off in three years, 500 million. So that w that was a big loss. Maybe, <clears throat> you know, they, they didn't, so it wasn't negotiated. We didn't give it up, they just took it. I'm sure we'd have settled for something less, but didn't have that chance. <clears throat> Do you think that Native corporations involve tribal organizations enough when it comes to development and funding? And if um, and how could they both work together to better the economy of rural Alaska? They should work together, but <clears throat> that, that's one of the unfortunate misunderstandings in, in, in the land, in, the lo in the, what's happening. <coughs> is uh, <coughs> Here, here's my argument with <coughs> excuse me there were 340 people 40,000 people in Alaska 
in round numbers when, uh, before the pipeline. And the big argument was uh, <clears throat> make the settlement because we're going to give you a choice of two worlds. You want to live in a village and live a li subsistence lifestyle, you can do that. You have the best of both worlds. If you want to work, you come to Anchorage or come here and get a job. <clears throat> and uh, that didn't happen. We have from 340,000 people, we now have 740,000 people. Villagers are still 60 to 80 percent unemployed. But the big problem is you can't make a life, make a living on subsistence uh, because you can't feed a family on a five day moose season. You can't feed a family if there's three days of fishing on the rivers. So you can't make a subsistence living. And even when they go out and hunt, if you go to Galena and some of these places, what's out there is uh, <clears throat> you think you're Lake Hood out here. All the airplanes are out there flying in hunters. And uh, you hear all the abuses or horns are coming out and no meat. So the people on the ground don't have jobs and they can't make a living. So <clears throat> and I, I think the state of Alaska is derelict. We spend, I don't know, what, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars per student in the universities, and that's good, maybe not enough. But we do not provide adequate uh, <clears throat> skills training. And we don't support the good skills. We don't have a good system of training skills. We have Seward Skill Center, which is kind of a stepchild. Nobody pays attention to it. <clears throat> the university has a president, goes down and talks for money for the university, but nobody's arguing for money for the skills. As a result, the big companies say, you, know, you, you complain about local hire, and they say, well, you bring me a trained person, I'll hire them. There aren't any trained persons, people. Headlines, I talked about going to Canada. Headlines in the national paper in Canada was, Canada embarks upon uh, skill training, training for skills, a workforce, a trained workforce. And you know, for economic development, you need four things, at least four things. You need a trained workforce, you need cheap energy, you need a good transportation system, and you, <clears throat> and you don't, we don't have that. We don't have a trained workforce. So as a result, uh, the, uh, nothing is happening in rural Alaska. And I blame this, this, the state for not providing for a trained workforce. Did I answer your question? Okay. So I'm also in Sharon, I'm in Sharon's class and our final project is on the 7i sharing mm -hmm. and <coughs> the unemployment question, we read an article <coughs> of yours and one of your quotes um, was we still have 80% unemployment in many of the villages, we need to get the employment up in those villages. Our question is with the 7i sharing being a, basically a give me for the have nots and the ha between the have nots and the haves between Native Village and Village Corporations and Regional Corporations, what is the incentive to encourage education and training when they just depend on that to live, to add to their bottom line? <coughs> well, the, the Shevanai sharings uh, are not nearly enough to make a living on, as you know. It goes from seven I <coughs> and when a 7i goes is split between the corporations, the corporations split that 7i into 7j. So half the money goes to the villages, <coughs> which may amount to, I don't know, what they get. The villages don't usually have a distribution. It's, the villages are so small, you know, um, probably 80%, uh, I shouldn't guess, but the big percentage of the uh, villages are less than 600 people. And what little money comes in under 7J is used up for rent and heat and electricity and salaries, and it doesn't do much. So 
the incentive if there is one is that I haven't gone to a village yet where somebody didn't come up to me and say, you will find me a job. <laughs> they need work. And it's not good for the state of Alaska to have pay $500 million a year in welfare payments. It'd be better to have a trained workforce. <clears throat> it's kind of just a general question. I was wondering sorry. if we didn't have like divisions among the natives, do you think this would have taken a different shift altogether? Did you hear? If we didn't have a division <coughs> among natives, would this have taken a different path? I don't quite understand. I'm not quite sure. I understand. Like the, the region, the di the dividing the oh, region. you mean yeah. the 12 regions, if it was one, one total entity? One of our first proposals was that we have one, one corporation. Uh, <clears throat> Congress wouldn't buy off on that. And I think it would have been, uh, have too much power in the state, so they broke it up. Uh, I'm just guessing, and maybe it, was, that, uh, it would have had a lot of power. Our proposal, we thought we'd have one set of lawyers, one set of advisors and counselors and investment people, <clears throat> and uh, it would have been a, a powerhouse. The corporations are strong now, but not nearly as strong as they could have been with one corporation. <clears throat> I heard you say that um, when it comes to Indian country, the villages are generally for and the corporations are generally against. And to me, it kind of brings up, it kind of puts the villages as the natives and the corporations as Congress, to me, in my mind. And I'm just wondering, how can we improve that? Because it was all about us being native and our connection to the land and not about money and about being greedy and having a 13% shareholder hire. How can we improve that? And how can we work together? Do you, what do you envision for the future so that we're, we're really for-profit organizations with a nonprofit mission and not just saying that on paper? Well, <clears throat> I think the, the hope for what you're talking about is right here in this room. <coughs> it's the younger people that are talk, saying that this split between villages and corporations are, are not healthy. And, and they'll solve it. But when you get the, uh, some of us older guys who are around fighting, uh, there are too many old wounds. There are too many uh, old battles that have been fought we'll never get together. So. It's, it's up to the young people, and I think in time it'll happen. I hope. No guarantees. But, but, but it's, it's much like the American system. It's, it's more like a political system than a corporate system. <clears throat> it's under corporate law and the votes and all that, but it's a, it's a vote-gathering system, and it has its weaknesses. And uh, as long as it's controlled by the corporations, um, it doesn't fit for the situation, so it might be around for a long time. But the hope is in the young people who just decide they don't want to see that. <clears throat> no more questions? I, I have, I have one. Yeah, Edgar? Um, it just has to be recorded for the video, so you, you just have to you don't have to have this close. But Emo, <coughs> the uh, Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act is often considered to be experimental or an experiment. Is the experiment over? I don't think so. It was an experiment in this sense. <coughs> How do, you get, how do you get a people from hunter and gatherers who <laughs> were very independent, built their own homes, made their own clothes? Not too long ago, when I was a kid, people were making their own clothes. 
And then how do you get them into a corporate boardroom where you talk about cumulative voting and yeah, distributions and assets and liabilities and all the things that go into governing? And um, our system, I don't think, can tolerate people who are outside of our, our system. So we do everything we can to get them into the Western economy. <clears throat> and uh, that's the experiment. Can you, can you jerk people from hunter-gatherers in one generation? And when, when the, the corporations hit the villages, you know, I've gone into the villages and they're asking, you know, how do we do this? How do we vote? What does it mean? How, how do we control the money? All these things. And the, and the experiment was to get people into the Western economy. And uh, that's going to take generations for maybe never for all the people. Okay. Then the second part of the question, Nemo, is. It was supposed to be short. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. The second part of the question is what's the next step in the experiment? Um, a flip answer would be talk to Bernie Sanders. <laughs> because um, the old system was sharing and sharing alike. You know, everybody shared. Nobody was hungry in the village. You know, you, <clears throat> you took care of the poorest families. And, uh, and it's turned the system upside down. <clears throat> in the village, accumulation of wealth was frowned upon. If you had too much, you, you potlatched it away. So everybody had, had something. If you didn't have a rifle, potlatch gave you one. And that's not the American system. So I don't know what the next step is. Uh, <clears throat> you, have to, it's, it's again in this room. You young people have to figure out a system to, to make it work in the villages. So we've got to figure out how to give it away now. And don't worry about giving it away. Someone will take it. <laughs> I didn't know you could ask questions. I'm sorry? <laughs> I said I didn't know instructors could ask questions, so I have to ask a question, He's if I may. Um, well, first of all, you know, I, I I get to serve on the board of directors of my native corporation, and for that I'm privileged. And I just want to thank you for carrying the burden of our people um, so well and getting us where we are today. Um, so I thank you for that. Um, it, knowing what you know now and looking back at the history, if you, if you could point out some of the things you're most proud of today, when you look at our native corporations, what what things strike you as being things that you're impressed with that we have accomplished as a people through the work of our native corporations? Things you may not have guessed back in 1966 <laughs> when you were holding that first AFN meeting. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> you know, in a lot of ways, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing that uh, these corporations got on their feet and now are billion dollar corporations. And they learned the system fast, good and the bad. But, uh, but I think they have to continue. Um, I wrote, I, I, I drew the logo for AFN and I put the motto underneath it. Progress, pride and heritage, integrity, pride and heritage, and progress. <clears throat> and if we stick to those, we'll do well. And in time, it's going to take, it'll, t it'll take time to get people up to speed. <clears throat> Okay. Let's give a wonderful hand for our.